Hello, everyone. My name is Soheil. I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, just uh, a quick poll. Who was uh, in the TCP analytics talk on the first day? The OK. A good portion. I should have changed the background slide, uh, the background color, so you think it's a different talk. Uh, but yeah, I, I try to not, uh, I try to um, skip the things you've seen, so it's less boring and you can get to the brick faster. Um, this is a joint work with Yu Chang and Yu Sok, and uh, I should acknowledge uh, this is uh, all started by Willem. Uh, he had a so time stamping to TCP, so this work wouldn't have been possible without his contribution, but his name, unfortunately, is not on the slide. So, um, we all uh, uh, had to fix uh, our family's computers. When we work somewhere, we are all asked why my RPC is slow, because we work in networking parts, right? And uh, when the RPC is slow, most of us just look at TCP info and say, to the, to the customer, to the user, to the developer in that organization that, yeah, this connection has RTT of 10 milliseconds with 3% loss rate. That's probably why your RPC is slow. And the user is just confused. And we are not really confident that the stats we are showing is actually going to help user fix that problem. And I'm pretty confident at the tail, even us don't have any idea based on TCP info what is going on. So at 99p and above, RPCs are not as slow because of average aggregate stats you see in TCP info. And if you try to explain the tail of your performance based on TCP info, you're just doing it wrong. Um, another approach is just look at the RPC and see when it was delivered by TCP, what loss rate it experienced, what was the pacing rate of this RPC at the time you were sending this RPC, when it was uh, shipped to the NIC, when it was act by the other side. Like explain exactly what happened to that RPC, what happened to the HTTP frame. And this is how you can, you can actually find bugs and debug stuff. So I'm hoping that in this talk, I can encourage um, like usage of uh, timestamps uh, for a network instrumentation instead of TCP info that I've heard many are using right now. So, uh, so time stamping provides uh, four uh, main uh, types of timestamps. Uh, when you call a send message, it's added to the TCP send queue or write queue, and then um, it enters the queue disk on the devices you have, and then sent by the hardware, received by the other side, something happens to it, TCP uh, sometimes later would acknowledge it, and then you receive the acknowledge on the uh, sender. So basically four uh, main timestamps here. I should use a pointer. So here, uh, it is sent by the driver or the NIC, so software versus hardware timestamp, receive on the other side, and then acknowledge. And uh, they have uh, names. The QDIS is a scheduled timestamp, but uh, software and hardware are basically TX software and hardware. Rx is Rx software and Rx hardware and acknowledge is acknowledged. So using uh, TCP, I, I explained this uh, on the first slide, but basically due to the things we um, uh, explained here, uh, explained uh, in the uh, TCP analytics, uh, you can use TCP info to explain why TCP, for example, delayed a packet why a, a, a packet was sent at a specific pacing rate, why the congestion window was, was uh, basically small. So um, when you're collecting these timestamps, you, to explain a specific delay, you also want to know the state of TCP, uh, why such a delay happened. You know it was sitting in the QDIS for a long time, but you need to look at to TCP stats. Uh, so while you're, uh, capturing these timestamps from the kernel in user space, you can also ask for TCP info in user space. But the problem is you are in user space, you can get uh, descheduled, you can get delayed. The TCP info you collect is not going to be accurate. It's not going to be from the time we were capturing the timestamp, not from the time the packet was being sent. So 
opt stats are basically uh, uh, the option you can add to timestamping. It will attach TCP info to all of these timestamps generated by the kernel. So when a packet enters QDIS, we capture, say, congestion window, pacing rate, retransmission, byte send, and everything, and you can read it in user space. So it gives you some metadata and statistics about why TCP make a, make a particular decision. We don't support it on receive side. Of course, if there's a use, we can, um, we can add that. Using uh, the API is uh, well documented, so we'll get to that. But there's some gotchas and uh, coordinate cases and quirks of this API, so I wanna uh, mention those uh, before getting into the details. The first one is for every device you have, you will get one scheduled timestamp. So if you're, say, uh, tunneling and then bonding uh, and then going to the physical NIC, you always get three scheduled, so you shouldn't be surprised. For every layer, there's just one schedule. Um, and this can be helpful to see which device is actually, like the latency of each device, because we have it before we enter QDIS up until we enter the next QDIS layer, so you, you see all the delays. Um, another uh, caveat here is the ACK timestamps include the receiver delay. So one thing that um, uh, Quick, if you attended the Quick talk that was added to Quick, was piggybacking this delay back to the receiver because uh, in user space, this delay is even worse. For kernel, we um, delay the acknowledgement in TCP. Uh, there are other stuff that can happen that can delay the acknowledgement. So this receiver delay is included in your ACKs uh, and you need to be careful about that. Um, Another uh, surprise uh, that uh, it's uh, uh, always, um, I, I've, I've seen this uh, surprising many, many different people with different backgrounds. Um, TCP can send packets synchronously inside the send message, so it's not always async. Depending on like how much window we have, if we can release the packet right away, TCP may or may not send your packet inside the syscall context. So when you are in the send message, you can uh, like generate QDisk uh, timestamp. You can generate the send times. It can hit the NIC, it can be sent, and then sometimes if your NIC is fast enough, it can even receive the ACK and then receive, uh, and, uh, and then user space sees a return from syscall. Remember from when we unlock the socket, we process access and stuff. So, um, these timestamps are causal. They are all from the same clock source. But when you read them, you can get surprised. So make sure you understand uh, this synchronous versus asynchronous sync in TCP. Now for the API. Um, it is well documented. Um, we have a, an example in self-test. Uh, last night, I uh, remembered we forgot to add opstats examples. I'll, I'll send a patch. But I'll have something on my laptop. I'll show you how we can read it. Uh, so the first thing you need to do, if you want to use this thing, you have to enable it on your socket. It's a socket level timestamp, uh, a socket option. Uh, so socket, so timestamping, and then you pass in a value. That value is a bit flag. Um, you can use uh, many different options. Uh, you can set many different op options in this bit flag, and then it enables uh, different variations of so timestamping so, so time for you. Uh, one uh, that if you want to get software timestamps, meaning scheduled, acknowledged, or sent uh, TX software, um, you have to enable soft timestamping software. If you want raw hardware, you can also enable raw hardware. There's a sys hardware in the enum, but that is deprecated. You, you can't, it's a no op. Um, if you want to, cust in addition to enabling this, you can optimize, uh, up, uh, customize it using options. So there are enums that start with soft timestamping opt. So you can get opt ID, opt TS only, opt stats, packet info, and TX software hardware. Uh, ID basically gives you an identifier per timestamp so you can know which packet is this timestamp for. So basically a TCP sequence, a relative sequence of the TCP packet. Uh, TS only. Um, 
By default, each timestamp is a clone of the original packet, and it's accounted to your RMEM, so it's high overhead. If you want to use this in production, you should always enable TS only unless you actually want to see the content of the packet. Uh, for if you, your usage just for performance analysis, that's probably unlikely you want to see the content. Um, opt stats is basically what I explained. It attaches extra stats to your timestamps. You can get the packet info. This uh, new option, the TX software and hardware, is a great addition uh, to recent kernels. Uh, software and hardware send timestamps were mutually exclusive. We didn't have any space to keep both. Uh, they added a feature to enable both software and hardware timestamps. So you can get the timestamps inside the driver as well as when the packet was transmitted by the NIC. So it's, it actually gives you another delta, which I didn't have in my, my, my uh, time sequence. But I wouldn't uh, explain that. Uh, and then these are all for enabling and customizing. And then you can also say, I want this types of timestamps. So I want software, for example, transmission, software receive, software act, software schedule. And these are like, you can mix and match and choose what, whatever you want. Um, this is one example here, which I skip. Now, for reading, when you enable this, you want to read this, right? To read this, there is an inherent difference. On receive, timestamps time on receive are very, very easy because they sit in the TCP receive queue. I have the timestamp. I just read it, give it to you on a C message. On transmit is actually very difficult um, because we may send the packets asynchronously, so the timestamps will be generated later. So we need an asynchronous communication mechanism to the user space. For that, we use error queue. Error queue, for those who don't know, is originally for receiving ICMP packets from the kernel. For example, traceroute is implemented using this. You receive the ICMP. Um, it was there. We don't have many flags to use, so the same. Uh, uh, Q is used for other types of control things. One is timestamps for zero copy. Willem uses this as well. It's a, it's, a, it's a control channel right now. It's not really an error queue. Um, for uh, reading opstats, when you receive these uh, timestamps from the error queue, you get the, uh, the value of timestamps and stuff like that. I'll show the API later, uh, the example later. But in addition to these, you can get a bunch of NLA or Netlink attributes, which are basically TLBs, like uh, type, length, and uh, value of um, the uh, TCP stats. We did this uh, because in TCP info, we learned the lesson that whenever we add a struct to the public API, a field to the public API, we can never remove that or take it back. So this way, we can just uh, remove things that we don't record anymore and we don't have to pay the cost of setting them. So there are some important um, uh, stats you can get. For example, you can get all of the TCP chronos, busy time, uh, RBIN limited, send buff limited, basically the time we were uh, in um, limited by receive window or send uh, buff uh, was limited so we couldn't send anything. You can get RTO, spacing rate, condition window, send queue, and many, many other fields. There's a code snippet. I tried to uh, somehow sh uh, shrink it to so that it fits in the slide. Um, let me show the show it on my laptop. So uh, there is a, there are two structures: socket extender and SCM timestamping. Uh, this one is the metadata. This one is the timestamp value. So you set your control uh, messages in your message. You create a buffer, what, whatever size you expect to get. Uh, you call uh, re receive message, but with a flag message error queue, then you start reading your control messages. And then um, if uh, for the TSS structure, uh, there would be a control message with type uh, CM timestamping, and uh, your extended error would be with these uh, levels and types. There are other stuff you can assert to make sure this is the correct extended error. Uh, I skipped that one. And then for times, for opstats, you also uh, get opstats as a type. Now, when you have these two, you can read uh, the timestamp. The extended error has EE info, which is stores the timestamp type. And then the 
ID, which is the opt ID that I explained, the relative TCP sequence would sit in your EE data. Remember, these are all for ICMP. So EE data, we couldn't rename it to EE ID, right? So we had to union stuff. So, uh, so the key is there, the type is there, and then based on the type, like a skip, send, or ACK, you can uh, look into these structures, uh, see the uh, kernel timestamps generated, and then you can process the um, upsets, the NLA in the upsets, print them to the user, and that's all. For the upstats, uh, it's pretty simple. The uh, idea is you just get the data, and then you go inside the data and then parse the NLAs. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult than casting it to TCP info, for example, but uh, I think it has many benefits. Just remember on some platforms, uh, this is not aligned. On some platforms, when you copy stuff that are unaligned, um, you can just simply cast it. You may uh, have issues, so just mem mem copy it. Otherwise, if you compile your binaries with UBSAN, uh, if the sanitizer would complain that you're copying on a line memory. So um, another feature that is available since 4.7 uh, is that you can enable timestamps per send message. In production, if you enable this as a set sock opt for like I want to receive send and schedule an act, it would generate basically a timestamp for every chunk you have written to the socket. That can be very costly. So we added a feature that you can enable this on a send message basis. So you can send whatever you want, with, it, would, it wouldn't generate any timestamp. And then when you give the kernel a C message that enables these timestamping features in TCP, it would generate the timestamps only for the packet created inside that send message. That gives you the, the capability to just sample a few sequences you are interested in. Um, if you look at gRPC, for example, uh, whenever we try to trace a RPC, we stitch it down from H2 to SSL, then to TCP, capture these timestamps, and then hook it up. Um, it's a very good sampling mechanism. I added support for UDP and RAW as well, but uh, what I'm explaining here is just for TCP. Um, timestamps are originally for RAW and UDP packets. They are one per send message. That is basically one packet. For TCP, it's not uh, a packet, it's basically whatever you have written in that send message. Uh, so it's one timestamp per successful send message if, whatever, if you have a positive return value from send message. Uh, if Is it per segment or is it per message? It is per message. It is the last byte of that message. And if you coalesce that with another send message that was in trace, you will get just one timestamp. The reason is we just have one SKB and then there's just one by date. Now, sometimes you actually want uh, the border, like the HTTP2 frame, an RPC or something like that. Martin from Facebook added message EOR to TCP. Uh, a while back in 4.7. When you send a message with message UR, kernel wouldn't coalesce anything to this send message. Now, if you want to trace something, flush whatever you have in your buffer with message UR. TCP doesn't coalesce anything to that previously written thing. Write your trace stuff and then it do message UR. So it's basically a very well-defined byte border and like a flush point for TCP, and you get the timestamp only for that byte offset. So you get a very accurate, you, you, you get very accurate uh, timestamp, but um, with the cost of missing coalescing, so it, it comes at a performance cost. Uh, this is the control message, so instead of doing the, uh, the set sock up, you enable everything, but you don't enable, uh, you don't set the timestamps you want. Instead, you pass the timestamps you want as control message to the send message, which is a pretty easy thing to do. Now, let me show you uh, uh, the self-test. So if you go to this folder uh, uh, in um, tools, testing, self-test, networking timestamping, there is a TX timestamping binary 
you can compile it and run it. I added upstat feature this morning. I'll, I'll send the patch upstream. But um, basically, you can ask it to uh, send uh, UDP raw or TCP packets to a particular port or destination, then you, you get all of the stats. I have a server running on port uh, 8000. Um, this is what you get out of that binary. I call the syscall uh, at this time. Uh, it returned at this time. And uh, in parentheses, we show the relative delta. So from the previous timestamp, it took 54 microseconds. Basically, the syscall enter exit 54 microseconds. Then I get the schedule. I'm probing the local host. So while I'm in send message, packet is sent. So it, was, it happened 25 microseconds before I returned from the send message. And at the time, TCP wasn't receiving window limited, wasn't send buff limited. The pacing rate was this val weird value, which is basically max int. If you don't believe me, you can just exit out. Um, the delivery rate was zero at that time. It was the very first packet. I see uh, the initial congestion window is 10. Uh, mean RTT is CNAC RTT, which is 62, and the delivery rate is in app limited. The next packet on the, uh, and sorry, uh, where's my pointer? I can't, okay. Uh, so the packet was sent to the loopback interface three microseconds after it, it entered QDISC. So the QDISC delay here is, is P503 microseconds. Uh, the reason that this this is a little bit high is because we, we queued the scheduled timestamp on the error queue. So there's one, like you have to generate the packet and queue it. So there's some, some cycles to, to be spent there. Uh, then we sent it. This is send timestamp. It got acknowledged 17 microseconds after the software timestamp. And all of this happened before I actually returned from the syscall, right? So overall, it took about, um, like uh, I think five microseconds before uh, I returned. The next packet goes out. Um, I do another send message, one packet send message, very small one. Now this time I have a delivery rate from previous send. You see if I'm slow starting to 11, my minimum RTT is 25, and this is app limited. My TCP doesn't have enough backlog to, to accurately probe the, the link. Uh, I get the same timestamps, almost same um, like uh, performance. And then on the next one, you see the same timestamps. I go to this congestion window. I'm basically slow starting, no loss, everything is fine. Now let's probe my employer. So this is google.com. Unfortunately, my Wi-Fi driver doesn't, have the, doesn't support the send timestamp, and I'm not allowed to modify my Wi-Fi driver on this machine. So I'm very sorry you wouldn't see the send timestamps, but this is what I probed. So um, here we are sending uh, the first packet. I closed it after the first one. Uh, this is the uh, scheduled timestamp. As you can see, it, it also happened before I returned from send message. And then I sent it out uh, uh, on the other side. And um, for some reason, let me do this. So. So there's a flag. Uh, if you set it, it waits for poll to return. Otherwise, it just returns from the. So um, where's my point? Here we go. So you can see the pacing rate here is actually a, a sane value. It's like I have a large RTT, six milliseconds here. Uh, congestion window 10. So I set the pacing rates. Uh, I got the ACK about two milliseconds after the QDIS released the thing. Uh, there was no loss. Minimum RTT dropped after this one. You can see the delivery rate. The pacing rate is still the same. Um, this delivery rate is uh, because um, we use the same thing for BBR. It goes to a max filter if you use uh, BBR. And this is very good if to debug BBR connections if you have issues. Um, same thing here, you can see RTT changes and everything. If I probe again, uh, you can see I get different values, uh, different act delays. I'm on Wi-Fi, you are all using your internet buffer bloat, all of that. So um, you, can, you, you can see a very accurate view of what is happening on this network. Um, so I have four more minutes. I'll go over the, 
common issues. If you deploy this in prod, this is the type of issues you can you can see. Uh, this one, uh, you, you can see I'm, I'm sending something. Uh, it took about 11 milliseconds to be released by the QDesk because I, I manually installed for, for this talk, I manually installed the HDB on my box. Um, so you can accurately see if a QDesk is hurting your performance. Uh, this is very common pattern uh, when your receiver doesn't open up its receive window. You can see you've been receive window limited for a long time. Uh, here, for example, uh, we sent a packet and then they were waiting for the user to read, so receive buff opens and then they send an ACK. So if you look at these counters, you can say, oh, your receive window is low. Uh, so either if you control the other side, go increase the, uh, the receive window or see whether the process can be made more efficient so it drains the socket faster. You can see uh, return, for, for each TCP retransmission of the same sequence, you'll get the same timestamps. So you get, say, the first retransmission would be sket send, and then if it, it's not act, it would be sket send. Uh, and you can also have to see the value of RTO in your op stats, so you can confirm if it was RTO, fast retransmission, whatever. Sorry, uh, loss repair or whatever. And then um, you can say, oh, there was a huge loss or there was a reachability issue at this point, so I have to resort to RTO. That's why your RPC is slow. Um, so uh, using these uh, in production will, if you enable this for all of your byte streams, all of your connections, uh, the overhead is per connection, so it would like if you enable it for 100% of packets of one connection, it wouldn't affect another one. But overall, you you get about 20% regression. So make sure you empirically find a good sampling rate if you want to use this. Um, you shouldn't enable this for all connections. The other issue, the uh, performance issue that we encountered was that. Um, for ICMP packets, we whenever we receive an ICMP packet on a TCP connection, we set the SK error if it's say unreachable, whatever. Um, for, uh, that basically happens for UDP and RAW as well. Uh, so uh, in DQ of a timestamp from the error queue, we were also setting SK error to the error code of the timestamps, which are not really error. It's e no message, but there's still a non-zero value there. And whenever we set the SK error, it basically means there is an error in this connection, so we have to pause. So your write and read would return with an error. And they will get paused until you clear the error. You can clear the error by draining the error queue. Never read the saw error. I learned this from Eric. It would do crazy stuff. It would uh, reset SK error. Um, you can, yeah. Uh, whenever you see epoll error, you have to drain your error queue and then continue read and write before 410. But after 410, if you have only timestamping enabled on your connection, we don't send SK error. And you can continue read and write without getting pauses from timestamps. And while <laughs> fixing this, when I removed this line, uh, ping and trace routes uh, broke because uh, they basically rely on this behavior. So for ICMP packets, we are still setting SK error, but not for timestamps. Uh, so moving forward, I think this is a very great, powerful, and mature, well-tested infrastructure that you can use. Um, the, the only problem with this is you can't really add a new timestamp. If you want another delay, like epoll in delay or something like that, you have to change the kernel. Uh, Larry had a talk on BPF, uh, eBPF for TCP analytics. Uh, that w is going to be a much better replacement for this whole infrastructure. Uh, if we add enough trace points. Um, so it would give us extensibility and uh, more like uh, access. We can, we can exactly collect what we want at the time we want it without uh, a one size fit all type of uh, instrumentation. Again, I, this work was done added, adding so time stamping to TCP was added, but was done by Willem, so I thank him for that. And thank you all for listening. 49 seconds. Questions? Uh, just probably, unless people insist, one, one question, that's it. 
Oh, oh, sorry, somebody was asking. Uh, okay. You have the mic there. Eh? So it's a very simple one. So this requires the app to effectively be in charge of monitoring. Is there a thought about how you can do secondary monitoring? Like is put in put it in SysFS or something so that if an app advertises that I am interested, it can start somebody else can attach to a SysFS node and read it. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, there were uh, Craig Gallic had some work in progress patch to send this timestamp with the info and that link so that some daemon can collect it on your host. But there's a problem. Uh, we decided not to go with that approach because uh, in user space, most of the time, apps have their own instrumentation and stats uh, infrastructure. You really want these timestamps to hop over those so the developer can actually see these. If you I send this to another, for example, for gRPC, you, there's op open tracing support, right? You want to attach this timestamp to the trace ID. Only the user space uh, or that process knows that. So it's very helpful if you just collect it in user space in that process. Definitely. Right. right. That's right, yeah. Yep. Uh, all right. OK. Last one. Just. I'm going to time you. So uh, talking about the TX timestamps and the overhead that is there, and we talked about the kernel part. Uh, when you do the hardware TX timestamps, uh, you will see the same kind of issues at high speeds that if you're timestamping every packet. One of the talks before we had, uh, we were talking about completions of TX and how you want to compress it. When you add timestamp to it, it actually doubles the size. So those are some of the things that um, you know we should keep in mind. Yes, great point. The uh, time, the time that is piggybacked by the NIC as to your descriptor size, so and your completion, sorry. Uh, and there is another catch to hardware timestamps. Sometimes ACK is generated because they can be received on another queue. You can receive an ACK before the hardware timestamps ready. So. It's very difficult to process. You have to be very careful. Um, but those are the catches. Sometimes you actually want it. For example, for NTP, they wanted very. They wanted to deduct all of the local host, like whatever overhead is on this host. So for those, you w really want to pay the cost, but have a very accurate measurement. Um, so that that is worth it. Thank you.